So statistics is actually a really powerful tool. A lot of people don't realize the value of even just putting statistics courses on their resume when they go to get um, to apply for jobs or for graduate school. But it turns out being able to interpret and use statistics makes you not just amazingly powerful, sexy, and scientific, but also employable. There have been some studies showing that. Uh, however, there are downsides to learning about statistics, especially if you learn to use like a statistical computer program, and that's that it's really easy to make mistakes, to plug things in inappropriately and get what seems to be a yes, no answer to your question, but not know how to interpret that appropriately. So if you didn't pay attention in your statistics classes, then it's really easy to come to the wrong conclusion and that can lead to say your company making a bad decision, things like that. So we could say with the great power of statistics comes great responsibility to think about uh, you know how to do it appropriately and also to look at uh, work that's done by others research done by others to be able to feel out and interpret if their work followed um, statistics appropriately so the reason I bring this up is you may have heard of something called the replication crisis it really hit a peak in the, the mid 2010s, um, but is still kind of going on today and, and leading to a lot of changes in scientific practice. The replication crisis is basically the, the finding when we start to look at a bunch of research uh, across a variety of scientific fields, the finding that a lot of the time that research doesn't hold up when we go back and check it a second time or a third time, when we try and repeat a study and, and see if it still holds up. So actually this has been out in the open for uh, quite a while is around two, 2005 was the first time that someone really brought this up in a way that caught on, got some press, got some attention, but it didn't really become a, a cultural phenomenon in science until the, the 2010s. Um, this original study back in 2005 was looking at medical research specifically. So in this journal about um, med medical research, John Ioannidis found that more than half of published research findings in the medical field end up being wrong when we go and do a, a replication or a repeat of the study. We go and check and see if the results hold up. So for example, you find that a certain kidney medication works, then uh, what, we, what we realize is half the time those results that originally showed the, the kidney medication working, turns out it doesn't. Or half the time that an animal model showed that something works, it, it turns out it doesn't. So when we talk about replication, I, I describe that as sort of a replication crisis. Replication is just defined as repeating a study. So it's, it's either you doing it yourself or some other lab repeating your study under the same kind of conditions, following the same kind of procedures to see if you or they find the same effect. So, so it's important here that you'd follow identical or very similar procedures. This is why most journal articles in science, when we write up journal articles, we have to write a method section that very clearly and very explicitly describes everything we did, all the equipment we used, everything as detailed as possible so that someone else can go and repeat our work so someone else can check it right this is what makes science so powerful compared to other ways of knowing in the world is this is something that that theoretically anyone should be able to go and check your work and find the same thing and that's why in the long run we should be able to trust scientific results if we've actually gone through the the hassle gone through the work of trying to replicate those studies, of finding out whether it works in multiple times and places every time we try it, then we start to trust it. The, the problem, the downside is when we get lazy about doing those replications, then we, we start to maybe accept or in the popular press, we might publicize and get um, people out in the field who aren't scientists to start to accept uh, scientific results that happen when, when it's just a single study, when it, when it just happened one time in this one research study, the initial study shows a promising effect in that one study and everyone takes it for granted that that means it's a real thing, that that means science has demonstrated it. But that's not always the case, right? We need to do mo multiple studies, more follow-up studies to, to really be sure about that. That's the replication process and it, it sometimes gets ignored when it comes to things like science journalism, where science journalists will write about a brand new study, right? It's news 
newsworthy because it's a new thing and so it grabs a lot of attention whereas a replication just showing the same thing that's been seen two or three times before may not be as exciting but that's what actual science is that's what gets us to to feel uh, comfortable or sure that this is the way the world works so replication is really important let me give you an example from real life again this is from from the medical field but uh, there was a, a researcher in Australia who, who originally sort of discovered, he published research on gluten insensitivity, what was called non-celiac gluten insensitivity. So celiac disease is something where people absolutely do have a dangerous reaction to gluten. It's very, very problematic for them. If, they have celiac, if you have celiac disease, gluten is bad for you. Well, this researcher, Peter Gibson, he is the person back in 2011 who found what seemed to be gluten sensitivity in people who didn't have celiac disease. So he published about this and people started uh, saying, oh, maybe gluten is why I'm having these troubles when I eat certain foods. I don't feel so good, right? Real gastrointestinal symptoms. People certainly do have gastrointestinal symptoms that they then blame on gluten. And that led to this huge proliferation of gluten-free foods, everything being av advertised as gluten-free. And you'll find all sorts of shit on the internet suggesting the dangers of gluten or how gluten causes problems for certain people who, again, don't have celiac disease, but who have been convinced they're intolerant of gluten. And again, that seems real and supported by science because you can find papers like back in 2011, the paper by this researcher, you can find this thing that does seem to show in that original paper, it did seem to show gluten sensitivity in these people who didn't have celiacs. So it seems like it's a real thing. But remember, that's just one paper. Well, a couple other papers came out and they found similar things, but it turns out the research design of those papers wasn't very strong. So the researcher, Peter Gibson, I think he's an example, a really shining example of good science, of what a scientist should do. Even though he had gotten famous off of this study that originally seemed to demonstrate gluten sensitivity, he decided actually it doesn't make a lot of sense based on some other things he knows about nutrition so he went and did a more rigorous a more careful study where he actually controlled people's diet and used a, a double blind procedure the kind of thing we use when we want to test like a medication or something like that where you give people a pill sometimes it's an empty placebo pill and sometimes it's a real pill with the experimental drug in it and that's that's kind of the shining best way of doing um, a lot of studies and, and so he said okay I'm gonna do that for nutrition in this case for for gluten and the way he did it was basically assigning some people to get um, 16 grams of gluten per day so a high gluten diet versus some people would get 2 grams of gluten and then 14 grams of another filler in this case whey protein and that's kind of a low gluten just a little bit of gluten and then some people get 16 grams of no gluten so a placebo and what he did is he, he first had people have just a plain diet a sort of a controlled diet without gluten that he had that he had taken care of and got rid of these um, special types of, of sugars called FODMAPs did this two week baseline diet. And then what he did is he just tested after everyone's been on the same diet for two weeks and he controls exactly what they eat. He knows exactly what they eat because he, I mean, this is a really expensive study. This is why nutrition studies are really hard to do properly. It costs a lot of money to make sure that people actually eat what you tell them to eat for that time. But then after those two weeks on the baseline, everyone went through these three diets, the high gluten, the low gluten, and the medium, or the, the placebo, sorry, the high, low, and, and no gluten conditions. Everyone did each of those. So, so it wasn't just that some people got the high gluten, some people got the low. Like everyone had a phase where they were going through a high gluten diet at some point in the study, and everyone had a phase where they went through a placebo at some point in the study. And he went and checked it and after this he, he did like follow-up careful controlled studies but basically what he found is the gluten made no difference there was no difference between when people were getting gluten a lot of gluten a little bit of gluten or no gluten no difference to the gastrointestinal symptoms turns out what what seems to be most connected to gastrointestinal symptoms for a lot of people are those short chain carbohydrates those kind of sugar type things um, FODMAPs so FODMAPs may be the thing that's in food that's causing people to have gastrointestinal symptoms and it just turns out that FODMAPs often go along with gluten they show up in a lot of the same foods as gluten so the whole gluten-free fad or, or whatever like 
has actually maybe been a mistake that came from this misinterpretation or, or I don't know, over interpretation of these earlier results. When it turns out it may be something else, we can only identify when we do things like these careful double blind studies. So now uh, the guy who, have, who originally discovered gluten sensitivity, again, non celiac gluten sensitivity, has now become a skeptic and he doesn't actually believe it's a real thing anymore. It's something else. He doesn't think gluten actually causes problems at all for these people, only for those with celiac. So that's just an example where we wouldn't know these things unless someone did a follow-up after those original studies and said, hey, I want to keep testing this stuff. I want to keep trying to prove myself wrong. Like a good scientist should always be trying to prove themselves wrong and find the holes in their arguments rather than trying to prove themselves right. Now, this, this issue with, with low reproducibility or low rates of replication that I talked about before, it's a, it's a big problem, and especially in something like medicine, right? So, so life science research, turns out we spend a hell of a lot of money on that, and the estimates are that probably about $28 billion per year is being spent on research that ends up not being replicable, not being reproducible. So about half of, of research in the, the life sciences or, or medical field ends up not, not being something that, that's true when we go and check it later. So that's a problem. We're wasting a ton of money, but also that means we're, we're not saving as many lives as we would be if we were being more careful about this. Now, it's not just a problem in medicine. It's actually in a lot of different fields. We've had a replication crisis in biology and chemistry and lots of fields, and certainly that applies to psychology as well. So I mentioned it was in the, the mid-2010s that this really took off, and psychology actually got a lot of press for this, um, specifically because psychologists, I think, did something right here. They went and checked. They went and said, let's do some giant, well-funded, giant tests to try and figure out how many psychology results do replicate, because that's something that people hadn't been checking systematically as much as they should. So in this big study where a bunch of people work together, a bunch of labs all work together to reproduce 100 psychology findings, 100 things that in, in these original papers that said, yeah, we found an effect, they went and repeated that following the same procedures and pre-approved pre criteria set at the start of the study that said, this is what we will count as replicating, as agreeing with those original findings, and, and this is what won't count as the threshold, you know, statistically speaking. So they went through and they repeated those 100 studies, and here's what they found. On the right, these 39 blocks, those are the 39 studies that did replicate according to that, the criteria they set at the start of the study. So based on the criteria they set at the start of this whole big project, these 39 definitely did repeat, definitely did support the original results. There were 61, though, the majority of studies from these big psychology journals, the majority of these studies did not actually replicate. Again, according to the, the proper stats that they set up at the start of this, kind of careful stats they set up at the start of this project, you can see from the light blue coloring here, uh, that means, the, this kind of top row here, that means the results they did they did get in these studies ended up being pretty similar so they still found pretty similar results but it didn't maybe quite meet the statistical threshold the careful statistical threshold they had set at the start of this big project and then some of the a lot of the studies ended up not being even close when they did this more careful replication bigger sample size what they found is actually the results were not at all similar or only slightly similar for a lot of those studies and again these are studies that are out in the scientific record where people have published um you know popular press articles about these things and, and in some cases we take them as true and we've started changing procedures or policies and things based on this, designing products based on this, and then we realize, oh, actually maybe that original study isn't true. We only find that out because we do this replication, right? And that's true of a lot of things. So at an overlap of kind of medicine and psychology, there's a lot of biopsychology that studies things like serotonin and dopamine and oxytocin and all these chemicals that affect our psychology. You may have heard of oxytocin as an example. Sometimes it's called the love hormone. And so there's all these, these studies that seem to show how oxytocin might be important for bonding and things like that. Well, a lot of research has... has um, done studies on oxytocin by squirting oxytocin into people's nose. So it's called intranasal oxytocin. This is the methodology in the research. You squirt oxytocin into the nose, and then you see if the people who got oxytocin 
uh, in their nose behave differently than people who got a plain saline, saline solution. So a plain placebo that doesn't actually have any chemical, any, any special chemical there in it. And you compare them and you find all these differences and it seems to show oxytocin has this effect. Okay. So, so that has led to a lot of, um, popular press like TED Talks and people talking all about the powers of oxytocin from this type of research. And that research is out there. It got published. It's in the scientific record. However, there's a problem here hiding that we don't often see. So just in, in one example, I found this write up from from a researcher who's published quite a bit of stuff on oxytocin. So so the researcher's last name is Lane and Lane's lab, their research had published a bunch of stuff about oxytocin, and how it alters human behavior. Problem is they went back. They 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 went back and they said, OK, we've published some stuff about oxytocin and the the Journal articles that we've published seem to suggest oxytocin works, that it has this effect on, on humans. But what we didn't tell you is we also ran some studies where oxytocin didn't work, where it didn't do anything at all. And we tried to get them published. We tried to get them out there in the scientific record, but none of the journals, none of the scientific journals would accept them. The editor would say, oh, it's not interesting enough, or oh, you found null results. In other words, you found results where there's no effect, where you weren't able to reject the null hypothesis. So the journals say, sorry, we're not going to publish those. They're not as exciting. They're not as newsworthy. Try somewhere else. And it turns out the authors did try. So they, they did... They did try and publish those null results, but they, they didn't actually get them published in a lot of journals. So they sat in the file drawer. They sat in the file drawer unpublished where no one else even knows that there are all these studies that were done that didn't find an effect of oxytocin. So in this case, they, they, they did a really good scientific thing. They published a paper about this very problem they had had and about the fact that the scientific record was missing all this negative evidence that would balance out all the hype. So they, they talk about eight studies that they've done. They've done a bunch of, they've done a bunch of studies, but eight studies they had done that were performed in their lab over five years. And what they found is some of those studies, about half of those studies got published. So across five journal articles, four of those studies did get published. Almost all of them were publishing positive results. In other words, they found an effect of oxytocin, but they submitted a bunch of studies yielding null findings, no, like where oxytocin doesn't work, and yet they got rejected over and over again. So what happens when these authors in this new paper, when they go back and they say, what if we look at all of the studies together, the ones that did find an effect, the ones that didn't, and we do a meta-analysis, we look across all the studies, turns out, Oxytocin has no detectable effect. The effect size was not different from zero. In other words, Cohen's D, this is a measure of effect size, how many standard deviations oxytocin changes things, is basically none. It has no real effect. So they conclude basically what we know about oxytocin on uh, this effects on human behaviors and cognition may not be real at all. All these studies that have used squirting oxytocin in the nose and seeing how it affects behavior, turns out those may have been false alarms just based on the fact that we weren't seeing all the negative results. Yikes. So that's another issue that can lead to, to um, and a scientific record that isn't necessarily accurate. There are other issues we have to worry about. So why might certain things not uh, why might certain things show up in the scientific record that look like we found a real effect when in fact we didn't? Well, we know about false positives, right? We know about type one errors or false positives where sometimes when you do a study, you know, 5% of the time, if you're using the usual 0 0.05 cutoff as your alpha value, then 5% of the time you'll get a false positive and that's, that's acceptable. We understand everyone goes in knowing that that's possible and that, that's why we do replications. But some people have started arguing that may not be good enough, like especially if people in the news and people who, who hype and publish all this stuff and to the to kind of everyday people and lay people, if they're not careful to explain that this initial study has a chance of being wrong, that this initial study might be a false positive, we don't imp, imp, kind of uh, mention that or, or emphasize that all the time, then people might take these these single studies as being more strong than they actually are. So people have argued one, one solution for this might just be to use a more stringent cutoff, a more stringent alpha value. So for your probability of a type one error, you might set it to 0 
In other words, half of a percent of the time, it would be a false positive rather than, or yeah, sorry, instead of 5% of the time, half of a percent of the time. So quite a bit um, lower chance of a false positive. That, that certainly could help things. We know that the downside of that is then we'll get a lot more false negatives. We'll get a lot more times where we don't find a real effect even when it's out there. So this lowers the statistical power right because power is your chance of finding an effect if one really does exist this lowers your statistical power so it's maybe not a perfect solution but it's one people have been considering for a while now as a possible solution um, and certainly some people have started using that just to be more confident about their own results now the the problem is a lot of the time people misinterpret and don't realize there's a there's an effect here that makes that 0 0.05 cutoff the alpha value of 0 0.05 not as solid as it initially seems so you might be thinking five percent type one error rate that sounds like a pretty decent cutoff or you know something we're willing to accept and if that's the case you might assume then that across a whole bunch of studies let's say we carry out a hundred or a thousand studies you might assume that 5% of them will end up being false positives if they all use this 5% false positive rate. And that seems intuitively correct, but it turns out that's actually wrong. And there was a, a study came out back in 2014 that showed why. It did a bunch of math to basically prove why that would be the case and then showed that this is probably what's happening in the real literature. We're not interpreting that 5% alpha value, that 5% false positive rate correctly. That is the false positive rate for an individual study if we do everything else correct, but across an aggregate literature of a bunch of studies, it doesn't actually work that way. And I'll show you why on the next slide. But as, they, as you can see here, if you use uh, a cutoff, an alpha value of 0 0.05, so a probability of 5% of a, of a false positive rate, then you're going to be wrong actually closer to 30% of the time. And if you uh, have underpowered experiments, so, so low statistical power, usually because you have a small sample size, so if you have a small sample size, which is often the case, too small of a sample size, then you're gonna, actually gonna be wrong most of the time. The results you find are actually gonna be false positives most of the time. So they talk about how they should, if you're interested, you can read this article is published in the, the Royal Society's journal. But um, basically they, they conclude like, we need to be much more careful and use something like a 0 0.001 cutoff to ensure that your false positive rate is truly below 5% across a bunch of articles. So let's let's think about this a little more because something weird is going on here. We've learned we know that an alpha value of 0 0.05 means 5% of the time, if there's no real effect, we're going to reject the null and think there's an effect. That's a type one error, right? right? We're accepting that by setting the alpha value of 0 0.05. It's a trade off. We have to set it somewhere, but we by by um, sort of by heuristic or, or you know how, how most people do it, we kind of agree that the standard in most fields is 0 0.05. So, so shouldn't it be that about 5% of studies across an aggregate set of a whole bunch of studies, that 5% of them should fail to replicate rather than, than more than that? Why? Why are we actually finding that so many statistically significant or real effect findings turn out to not be significant when we replicate them on the second or third try. Here's this is this, the picture here is from the economist but this is a, an analysis that some scientists have have pointed out. So think of it this way. The reason things might be going really weird here is think of maybe we've got a thousand hypotheses. This is hypothetical, but imagine just a thousand possible hypotheses we might want to test using science. Okay. And let's just assume that the base rate of those hypotheses, the base rate of how many are actually true is pretty low. Let's say it's one in 10. So we've drawn a hundred of these, the ones in green here, a hundred. These are where there really is truly an effect. There's an actual effect. The hypothesis is true. And then 95% or sorry, nine. So 900 of these 90% of the time, the hypothesis we might test turns out to be false. Okay. So if this is the case, just hypothetically speaking, if you have a low base rate of them being of the hypotheses being true relative to those that are false, then let's say, we, we go and actually test all thousand of those hypotheses using standard science and using our normal false positive rate of 5%, our alpha value of 
0 0.05. If that's the case, then when we carry all this out, what we're going to find with that false positive rate of 5% is we're going to, when we test those true, right, the 100 true hypotheses, the things where there is a real effect, a bunch of the time we are going to find the real effect, right, and that's good. But we're going to find a whole bunch of false positives, right? So what's going to happen is in this kind of gray part here, this grayish darker part here, these are false positives, meaning of the 900 hypotheses that are, that are actually false, 900 things where there's not a real effect, 45 of those we're going to find an effect in our study, we're going to get a false positive, a type 1 error, right? And so we're also going to miss, just given, uh, let's say that we have a statistical power of 0.8, then that means of the true things, we're only going to detect, you know, let's say 80% of those. So 80 of these 100, we, we found the, the correct thing. We found the real effect when it exists, 20 we missed. And here we found ones that we think are true, but actually aren't. So what we've got here in the green and in this darker color, the kind of darker grayish green, those are all the studies, the scientific studies out of the thousand we did that said, oh yes, we found an effect. But that's a problem because we don't know which of these, of all these that we found statistically significant results, all of these that we rejected the null hypothesis, we don't know which ones are false positives and which aren't. But notice it's a hell of a lot more than 5% of these studies that we did find an effect, it's more than 5% that are wrong because we did so many tests on hypotheses that aren't true. The base rate was so low that this can inflate how many false positives we get beyond just 5%. And that's easy to miss if you're just looking at an individual study because yes, each individual study only has a 5% false positive rate, but across an entire literature and across an entire aggregate of all the science we're doing, we actually end up with a hell of a lot more false positives than that. Uh, you know, relative to the number of true positives we're getting. And again, these are all mixed up and we don't know which which of these studies when it's published in the in the research literature or when someone writes about it in popular science, we don't know which of these is the real, the, the true effects and which are the false positives. So getting back to that idea I talked about earlier with oxytocin, one major problem we've had in science up until recently, it's getting a little better now, but we still struggle a lot with this problem, is something called the file drawer problem. This is where null results, this means I didn't find an effect. We sometimes call these null results because you are not able to reject the null hypothesis. So I don't know whether or not the null is true, but I'm not able to reject it. I didn't find an effect. So we call those null results. The problem is we, we know for a fact from a lot of studies on this that null results are much less likely to be published than statistically significant results, than the ones where we did find an effect. So you go and do the science, and as a scientist, you should be like, whatever the results are, those are interesting, I should publish them so other people know the truth about the world. But it turns out the way the, the real world works is a bunch of scientific journals have editors who want their journal to be kind of famous and, and only publish uh, stuff that's flashy and shiny, and so they only accept the, the results that they think people will pay attention to, in other words, those that show an effect, and if there are no results, they'll say, oh, sorry, this is good science, but we don't want to publish it. We only publish so many articles a year. Try a different journal. Try somewhere else. And so the authors will try somewhere else, and they'll hear the same thing. Oh, this is good science. You did, you did good procedures, but you didn't find anything interesting. We don't want to publish it. We, we only publish so many articles a year. Try some other journal. And the authors try somewhere else, and eventually they give up. No one will publish no results and this happens a lot a lot more than you think why well it's just like why is this happening because significant results just seem to be more interesting to people right they make more press they make your journal more famous and scientific journals want subscribers they want citations to their articles they want a high impact factor which only happens if articles are getting cited a lot on average so they try to only publish findings that will draw attention. And that leads to the side effect of science in general suffering hugely. Ideally, we should be publishing every study, or at least every well done study, every study that followed proper scientific procedures, we should be publishing all of those studies, regardless of how interesting the outcome is, right? Because that increases our knowledge as a species, helps us understand things. 
Oh, I don't know why this gif isn't playing. It's a guy smashing his head over and over and over and over on a watermelon. Um, so instead, what happens is we only let people share significant results. So the, the published science gets skewed towards this probability less than 0 0.05. In other words, when our alpha value of 0 0.05, when we, we get below that, then we reject the null hypothesis. Those are the ones that get published. And so we see out there in the published literature, a buttload of real effects. I'm putting air quotes, quote unquote, real effects, when really some of those are false positives. And we're not seeing any of those null results that might balance things out. So it's kind of like editing things to only show the time where you get it right and, and not showing people all those times when it didn't work. Let me give you an example of this. Imagine you try something 20 times, right? And one of those 20 times it works. That's, if, if that's the only time that you tell people about and you don't tell them about the 19 times it didn't work, then they might assume that you're able to do this thing really easily, that they should be able to do it easily, that it always works, right? Because they only see the one time that it works and they don't see the 19 failures. This is often the case when we think about successful businesses, successful entrepreneurs. Most people don't realize the majority, the vast majority of small businesses fail. The vast majority of entrepreneurs fail in each of their attempts, right? Individual attempts at opening a business, starting a new thing, usually fail. But we don't see those failures as much. What we see are the big successes and they stand out. And so we start to, to assume then that if we start a business, we'll have a higher chance of it working than it actually does. So same thing with science. If you think of it as a 5% false positive rate, then what could happen is if there's no real effect, and you go and study this thing, you try this thing 20 times, you do the research study 20 times, and again, assume that there's not a real effect here. There's no actual effect, but one of those 20 times, that's 5%, one in 20 is 5%, so one of those times we're gonna get a false positive where it looks like the thing has an effect. It looks like there's a real effect there in that one study, and, and in the 19 others it properly said, nope, it didn't work, right? Well, what happens if that one is what people hear about and the 19 they never hear about? That's kind of what's happening in science. So a lot of the times when there's not a real effect, we don't realize all the times that people tried to show the effect and failed, and we only see the false positive showing up, and so we think it's a real effect. This is a good example from XKCD comic, um, uh, Randall Monroe's comic. I think there's a good funny example of it. Guy says, I'm psychic, you know, and she says, there's no such thing. He says, okay, think of a number from one to 100. She says, okay. And then he guesses a random number, whatever number. He says, 43. And she goes, holy shit. Like, it just so happens that he, that he guessed her number. And he's like, I try not to let it affect my life too much. And she's like, wait, I can't believe this. Don't worry about it. Forget I said anything, but let's just get to the movie. Uh, okay, sure. And then here's the, the funny part of the bottom. This trick only works 1% of the time, but when it does, it's totally worth it. In other words, he just guesses 43 for everyone but if you ask a hundred people and they're all just randomly coming up with a number in their head then about one percent of the time one in a hundred times you're going to be right just by accident by coincidence so 99 of those times people will be like uh, no you're not psychic you got it wrong but the one time you get it right by coincidence you'll really convince people uh, i thought that was a funny analogy for this file drawer problem now this is why we shouldn't be okay, or why we, sorry, we should be okay with null results in our studies. Something is wrong when we're only noticing or only publishing or only getting excited about the positive results, the times we did find an effect that skews science. Now it turns out when we look across a bunch of different fields, we've got what, what potentially may be a problem here. It doesn't mean that things absolutely are wrong, but if we look at the literature and of all the articles published in various different fields like space sciences, neuroscience, some social sciences, biology and chemistry, psychiatry, material science, and so on, what we find is a high proportion in some fields, a high proportion of the articles that show up in the literature found positive results, found a quote unquote real effect. So you can see psychiatry and psychology, so mental health and other, and then psychology studies, 
those tend to pretty much only publish articles that are statistically significant. And again, this isn't just a social science thing because notice that materials science, this is a very like strict engineering and physics field, they've got the same problem, this medical field of pharmacology, same problem, clinical medicine just about as bad, biology just about as bad, economics and business just about as bad. Yes, there are better examples where there seems to be a better culture of being willing to publish null results. So 30% of space science results end up being mm, fail to reject the null hypothesis and that's okay. And then the other 70% do find a real effect or, you know, find, uh, they reject the null hypothesis. They, they find what appears to be an effect. So it differs a little bit by fields here, but e either way across all these fields, we're still seeing mostly just uh, effects like positive effects being being published and, and not much null results showing up in the literature. Now, there are ways to improve this. So for example, there, there have been laws passed, regulations actually seem to make a difference here. So the FDA pu published an amendment called Section 801 and uh, researchers looked at, at research, at medical research, clinical trials that were done prior to Section 801, prior to that, that regulation being established and, and then after the regulation was established. And they looked across this whole literature, all these studies that were done uh, to, to see whether things changed. So this literature basically said, hey, you have to pre-register a clinical trial on this clinicaltrials.gov website. So, so the regulation says if you, if you want to do a clinical trial, you have to register it ahead of time. You have to do all these other things. And so they compared, what about all the studies that were done back in the Wild West before there was regulation, in other words, before the year 2000, versus after the regulations went into effect, after the year 2000, did that change what happens in science? And so they looked at this stuff, and again, they're only looking at things that use like placebo-controlled trials and things like that. And they looked at how many before and after found positive results. So the old, in the olden times, prior to those regulations, the studies they looked at, 17 of the 30 clinical trials, 57% found a significant effect. In other words, they rejected the null hypothesis. They said this drug works or this surgery works, okay? But after the year 2000, looking at the trials that were done after that, only two of the 25, so it went from most, right, the majority of studies finding a real effect. Oh, our pill works. Oh, our pill works to only 8% finding that the pill works or the surgery works. So suddenly when we actually have regulations and people have to follow the rules and do science more carefully because the law makes them because the federal government requires them to do things more carefully. Now we suddenly have fewer false positives. We have more clinical trials showing up that say, oh, actually this drug doesn't work. This, this thing doesn't work. Um, and, and we still have to publish it, right? Because we pre-registered. We said, we're doing this clinical trial. We can't leave it in the file drawer. So that's what used to happen is all these pharmaceutical companies might, might run hundreds and hundreds of, of trials, but they don't publish the results of the negative ones. They only publish the results of the positive ones. And then they go to sell those pills or, or sell that treatment. And of course they're selling it based on some of those being false positives based on that file drawer effect. So regulations actually seem to be able to help that. It did seem to improve things quite a bit. So uh, re reporting of positive results actually went quite a bit down after the regulations kicked in. And that's a really good thing. That means we're more likely to publish null results, which means we're more likely to publish the truth and not inflate things with the file drawer problem. Now. It's not just this, this replication crisis isn't the only issue or, or there, are other, there are other things that go into this replication crisis. So some studies turn out wrong when we go to check them later, just because the statistics, statistics are complicated, they're hard. And so the statistics may have been used improperly. It's actually hard to juggle all those tests. Oh, this should be juggling. Oh, this doesn't, the GIFs aren't working, but it's hard to juggle all the statistical tests. You might need to do all the knowledge you need for that stuff. It's really easy to accidentally pick the wrong test or to plug things uh, into a statistical program wrong and not check the assumptions and things like that. So it's easy to, to violate the, the proper procedures and assumptions necessary for your stats to give you truth at the end of it. And so it's really easy to mess up stats and that means a lot of poor stats um, will actually still get published and maybe not even caught in peer review because this stuff is so complicated.
So just for example, there was a study back in 2011 that looked at this problem. They wanted to study how often um, there were statistical reporting errors in, in this case, it was specifically in psychology. But again, people have done this same thing in other fields in the last 10 years and found the same thing. Um, but they looked at how, how often when people are reporting test statistics, like a T value or a Z value or an F value, how often they made mistakes or wrote things wrong when they're listing the degrees of freedom for a statistical test, how often they seem to have used the wrong degrees of freedom uh, or, or calculated P values, so probability values, basically whether they rejected the null hypothesis, whether they did that right or wrong. They looked across really high impact, so kind of famous psychology journals and lower impact, not as famous psychology journals. And they found that this is the case in a lot of them, around 18% of the statistical results they looked at, published in this random selection of, of articles, almost one in five had some sort of stat incorrectly reported. Now, it didn't always make an effect. Sometimes it was just a typo, a minor error that didn't make a difference. Um, but around 15% of the articles they looked at contained at least one statistical conclusion that ended up when they calculated it properly to be incorrect. In other words, it changed the results of the study. 15% of the time, the, the, it changed the results of the study. So when they recalculated it, it went from a significant result to insignificant or vice versa. And not only that, here's where it gets really interesting. These errors were more likely to be in line with the researchers' expectations, the researchers' hypotheses. In other words, it may be that those errors are, that are a little more likely to happen if it supports your hypothesis, which suggests some bias may be going on there. And again, this is probably unconscious bias. It doesn't necessarily mean this is fraud, although that sometimes happens, but more likely this is unconscious bias that's slipping in. And we're finding that when we go one of those places it slips in is in the mistakes made during the statistical process. So what is a real world solution for how statistics are, are so complicated that we can easily make mistakes? Find people who know stats. So find collaborators, often this would be like co-authors for a scientific study, who are experts in statistics. But it also means if you're asked to do statistics for your job and you're not really sure uh, how to do it properly if you're doing everything right, then don't be afraid to ask someone, even if it means going online to a statistics forum or a Reddit, you know, subreddit for statistics or something. But don't be afraid to ask people because that's better than running the statistics improperly. Now, as I said, fraud does happen. It's not very common. If we look at the percentage of scientific papers that get retracted every year, retraction usually happens because we've discovered someone um, committed fraud or some other really major issue. And actually, like the, the, the number of retractions we get each year has gone up quite a bit since the early 2000s. Since around 2005, the number of retractions has skyrocketed. But... Part of that is just that we're getting better at detecting those. So we're finding statistical procedures, the irony, we're using stats to find these problems, but statistical procedures that can identify problematic papers where fraud or something like that might have occurred. So probably it's not that the, the fraud has gone up necessarily, although that might also be the case, but probably we're just detecting it better and that's why we're getting more of those papers retracted and pulled out, permanently pulled out of the scientific literature. But notice, this is still a very small percentage. So it's 0.01% of articles getting retracted, even at this high rate in, in the late 2000s. So in that case, it's, it's not probably fraud that's leading to most of these problems. And we got some reasons to believe that there was a, a study back in 2009 that looked at scientific misconduct that had been reported, so just so discovered, and, and classified what type of scientific misconduct had happened. And the blue bar here, this is what we might call serious scientific misconduct. Sometimes this gets self-reported. So on the left here, this is when scientists self-report scientific misconduct. Either they admit to sloppy procedures or fraud or something else that they did, um, but, but them reporting it or just discovering their own errors and being like, oh crap, we need to retract this article, right? So sometimes it's self-reported. More often it's reported by a colleague, right? Someone they're working with, a collaborator, something like that reports it. But 
What you'll notice here, the blue bar, this is serious misconduct. In other words, things that are intentional, like fraud or something like that. The red bar, the vast majority of scientific misconduct, uh, in other words, of, of problems we find where people didn't follow proper statistical procedures, are what we call questionable research practices. In other words, they're often people doing kind of the standard way of doing science, like like how people for a long time used to do science, which is, oh, if I don't find statistically significant results, if my hypothesis isn't supported, then maybe I'll try this alternative way, a different statistical test. Maybe I'll try this alternative way. Maybe I'll exclude some outliers. Maybe I'll do some other little tricks from my bag of tricks that, that I'll try over and over and over again. Or maybe I'll just go back and collect more data. Maybe I'll just go out and get more participants and then check my stats again. Maybe every 50 participants, I'll check and see if I've got statistically significant results until I happen to get the results I want, and then I'll publish it. That would be questionable research practices. It leads to bad science, but it's it's people not necessarily breaking the formal rules, but doing things that, or at least how the formal rules used to be, but doing things that, that, that can lead to false results. Nowadays, we're, we're, we've started to identify these questionable research practices and find ways to make them less likely to occur to make it harder for people to do that either on purpose or by accident some of that just means better training during graduate school so that researchers aren't as sloppy the the what these questionable research research practices come from though is basically most researchers when they're doing their statistics when they're designing their studies when they're figuring out how to do this science and how when they're writing up the article they have so many degrees of freedom in their choices. In other words, so many different choices they make along the way, both during and after a study. So when they're designing or carrying out the study, when to stop the study, how many participants to collect, and how they do the analysis afterward. There are so many choices you make along the way that people can end up unconsciously biasing their own results just by making the choices that are most likely to give them positive significant results and thus ones that'll make the news and help their career and get them you know so they can keep their job so it's leading to researchers unconsciously screwing up their own science and screwing up the scientific record because they're they're so um because there's these perverse incentives that make us feel like we need to publish results that are positive or that's how you make a name for yourself that's how you make a career even though that doesn't actually benefit science in the long run so there have been lots of um in the in the 2000s like i said the 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 replication crisis really has become a big topic and so there there have been lots of new procedures developed to help people find like to detect in the literature uh, where people might have used questionable research practices um, and again one of those ways that can happen is people kind of fiddling with their statistical analysis trying different ways trying different um, procedures or different statistical tests until they get the results they want and there are ways we can now detect that not necessarily in a single study but if we look at say a hundred studies we can find the presence of that for example if we find that a bunch of studies are just below that 0 0.05 cutoff in other words just over the threshold necessary to reject the null hypothesis and if that's just like so many of them are just past that cutoff and not very many are just not quite past that cutoff in the way you would expect if we were following all procedures it should be more kind of both and right it should be right around there uh kind of the same just about the same number that are just over the cutoff that are not just over the cutoff since we don't find that, that's the kind of thing that can suggest across this hundred studies we're looking at, we don't know which ones, but some of those obviously are false positives. We can detect that in the literature, again, using statistics. So let me give you one example of questionable research practices, and then I'll end this first video on this stuff. So just to give you an example from the research literature, there's something called the competitive reaction time task. So it's a research tool used to, to probe aggression. In other words, it's a way of measuring aggression. If you want to know whether, let's say, I don't know, snorting oxytocin increases or decreases aggression, you need a way to operationalize aggression. You need a way for your construct of aggression to think about how you're going to measure it. And one way people measure it, a sort of standardized way of measuring aggression, is this competitive reaction time task. So CRTT. What is it? 
Well, uh, participants are given the chance to lash out at their opponents in a game by subjecting them to annoying blasts of loud noise. So that's a way of measuring aggression is basically, do you punish the other person? It's an, you're in a competitive task. Do you punish the other person by making them uh, hear this blast of loud noise? If you do it a lot, that would be a lot of aggression. If you don't do it a lot, that would not be a lot of aggression. This is one way of measuring aggression in a laboratory that doesn't involve people punching each other, right? So it's just a way of operationalizing the construct of aggression, which we have to do for any scientific study. Now, as I said, that that's interpreted, using that noise is interpreted as aggressive behavior, but how do we actually quantify the use of this blast of loud noise? In other words, how do we quantify aggression even when we know we're measuring aggression as using that loud noise? How do we actually put a number to that? And this, this psychologist from Germany decided almost as a joke, but, but kind of to say like how messed up this literature is and, and thus probably lots of other literatures. This researcher looked at all the studies that had been done on this particular aggression task or using this particular aggression measure and he, he actually um, wrote his analysis on flexiblemeasures.com to show all the flexible different ways researchers had chosen to measure aggression, to quantify or put a number to aggression using this exact same damn procedure and yet somehow doing it in a bunch of different ways. So for example, some of the studies he looked at, researchers who used this competitive reaction time task, they defined aggression as the average volume of the noise inflicted. So higher average volume of noise, that's more aggression. Others looked at the duration, so how long pre people pressed the button, how much noise total, like how long the noise was that people used. Others, it was volume multiplied by duration in some studies, that's a different way of putting a number to this. And then there are actually, when he, when he looked at all the different ways you could combine these things and look at it, he found over 147 different ways of analyzing the, the, the noise blast measure of aggression. And that's weird, right? There's so many weird different ways of doing it, but that means researchers, when they go and carry out one of these studies and they've collected all their data and they've got a measure of when people press that button, how long they press that button, all those things, when the researchers go to analyze their data, they have 147 different ways they could run the numbers. They could they could say, oh, let's check the average volume and see if we found an effect. Did aggression go up when they snorted oxytocin? Well, based on the volume of the loud blasts of noise, nope, aggression didn't go up. Oxytocin didn't work. Okay, well, rather than publish null results, let's check the duration. So let's instead measure whether the duration of the loud noise use went up in the oxytocin condition. And they might go and check that and they're like, oh, nope, statistically still null results, no effect. Oxytocin didn't seem to work, but we, that won't get us published. So let's try something different. Let's try volume multiplied by duration. And you keep trying these strategies, different ways of analyzing the exact same data until you find the one that says, yes, we found statistically significant results. Yes, we rejected the null hypothesis. And then that's what you go and publish. That is messed up. That is bad procedure. That is uh, questionable research practices by the researchers, right? Based on these researcher degrees of freedom, they have the freedom to choose between these different ways of measuring things that leads to problems. So in this analysis that German researcher did, again, just for that CRRT or CRTT, just for that one way of measuring aggression, what he showed is sometimes they use volume based. So some of the studies he looked at used volume based quantification. Sometimes they use duration based. That's in green here. Sometimes they use composite. In other words, a combination of volume and duration, like volume times duration, or you can see all the different ways it was analyzed. So in one publication, it was volume plus the sum of the duration for the average of trials three through nine and then standardized. And in others, it was the volume times the duration and the number of high settings in the 80th percentile in all trials for 25 trials. Sometimes it was volume times duration, number of settings, but looking at the 90th percentile. So those who did the most, the high settings was defined as 90th percentile, or here high settings was defined as 80th percentile. Turns out making the choice of high settings being defined this way or this way might actually make a difference to the results. And people are able to kind of just freely choose whatever definitions they want as long as they tell us what they used but that means we're going to end up with problems in the research literature. So that's why the more freedom that researchers have when they go to do their analysis, the more likely that they'll kind of unconsciously or just due to these perverse incentives, they end up doing these things that make it more likely they'll get 
quote unquote positive results, even if those things aren't real. So I know this stuff might not seem that important, right? Debating the merits of statistics seems kind of boring until you realize it actually affects what treatment the doctor gives your dying relative or what treatment you get when you get sick, whether a certain pill is prescribed or not. It's really important that scientists follow proper procedures and that we address these issues. So certainly we have started to address the issues I've talked about in this video in the replication crisis. Um, and so we've gotten a lot better, especially as we go into the to the 2020s, we're, we're getting a lot better where journal articles um, will be required a lot of the time to pre-register their analyses. In other words, to say ahead of time, before they even collect the data, this is exactly how we're defining things and this is exactly how we're going to analyze the data using these stats, we're going to follow these rules and to agree to all that stuff publicly before you go and collect the data so that you don't have the freedom afterwards to, to do any sort of biased um, manipulation or biased analysis of your data. So I'm going to stop this first video here. There will be a second one to follow up with a little bit more on issues, uh, sort of big picture, big picture issues of statistics and how things can go wrong and, and lead to these problems.